Okay, joining us now are uh, Ben Wittes and Judge uh, Lawrence Silberman. And uh, Mr. Wittes, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome back. Um, so we have a very short time here, so I'm going to be very brief in introducing Judge Silberman uh, and try to say as few words as I can uh, to give him as much time as possible in the next half hour. So I, I think Judge Silberman needs uh, no introduction for most of the, uh, this audience, uh, but uh, for those of you who uh, do not know him and his work, he has one of the most amazing Washington careers and of, of anybody I've ever uh, dealt with. Uh, service from, from, as ambassador to Yugoslavia, solicitor of labor, am I right? Uh, Deputy Attorney General, uh, at judge uh, for many years on, on the DC Circuit where he's still a senior judge. And, um, and most particularly for purposes of this conversation was the co-chair of what's called the Silberman Rob Commission, uh, which examined uh, the use of intelligence uh, in the run up to the Iraq war and the production of intelligence. And so it's a it's a great pleasure to have him here. One of the key recommendations of that uh, commission will, will be of substantial interest to this audience, and of course the reason we're having this conversation. We'll get to that in a moment, but I wanted to start, if we could, Judge, with um, a broader question about the commission. It has become a, a, a frequent narrative in a lot of conversations about intelligence and the Iraq war a lot of people believe, and it gets said, you know, all the time on the Sunday talk shows that, you know, the, the, administ the Bush administration lied its way into the war in Iraq. And you guys studied this at a, you know, intensely over a long period of time. And I'm just interested, that is not the, the that is not what you guys found in this commission. And so I'm just interested in sort of your sense of uh, like an overview of of what you did and didn't find regarding the use and abuse of intelligence in, in the run-up to the war? I should I'd be glad to respond to that, but I should first make a correction. As far as I'm concerned, the commission was always called Rob Silberman, <laughs> <laughs> which had a sort of funny consequence because when it was announced, it was announced as the Rob Silberman Commission, and my son, his name is Rob Silberman, <laughs> and he was the CEO of a publicly held corporation. The stock dropped 10 points when there was an announcement. <laughs> he was aggrieved. Uh, the charge that sometimes you hear that uh, Bush or the Bush administration lied us into the war is an infamous canard. We studied that as hard as anything. Uh, remember, we had a carefully chosen bipartisan commission uh, one of my colleagues, Judge Pat Wald, was on the commission uh, in no small part because I uh, recommended her and talked the president into it. She's hardly uh, an apologist for the conservative movement in this country. We examined, Pat and I, every, we, uh, the actual intelligence that went to the president and prior president over, over every day. The two of us did, and it took us weeks. Um, we also uh, carefully examined the question of whether or not the administration had ever, ever pressured anybody in the intelligence community with respect to the weapons of mass destruction. There was not one shred of evidence to support that, not the slightest shred. We were particularly impressed that people at the CIA and other intelligence agencies who were against the war made clear to us that there was never, ever any pressure on the intelligence community on that issue. There was an effort on the part of the administration to push the question of whether or not there was any connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam. And the intelligence community, if anything, leaned over backwards to reject that, aggravated that the issue was even raised. 
And uh, when the uh, CIA director testified before Congress, he admitted they actually leaned, leaned over backwards on that because they were rejecting the uh, hypothesis from the, some in the administration. On the weapons of mass destruction, there was zero doubt within the intelligence community, and there was zero pressure on the intelligence community from the administration. As a matter of fact, the intelligence community was certain of that even under the Clinton administration. So I'm glad, I'm, uh, it's annoying that that would come out. It's just absolutely baloney. So I'll tell you where the, it all came from a Washington Post story from a reporter who was a student of mine at Georgetown Law School, an older man. And he had, his source of that was a young man at the CIA who said that when Dick Cheney came out to the CIA to ask about the intelligence, he was intimidated because the vice president had traveled to the CIA, which was absolutely ludicrous. All right, so let's move on from the absolutely ludicrous. Um, so the reason we're having this conversation is that this commission recommended the creation of what became NSD. And my, and so I wanna start with the question, what was the problem that you saw in, in, in examining the issues before the commission that led you to say there's an internal management organization issue at the Justice Department and the FBI that, that we need to think about redoing so that something like this doesn't happen again? Well, the truth of the matter, this concern had almost nothing to do with the weapons of mass destruction uh, imbroglio. Uh, it really goes back to my time as Deputy Attorney General many years ago. And I had the strong impression when I was Deputy Attorney General that in the, in the Bureau, the counterintelligence people were a stepchild. Uh, I also had written an article in the Wall Street Journal reviewing a book by James Q. Wilson called The Investigators, in which he had carefully de described the differences between DEA investigators and FBI, pointing out that you, re you really need different kind of people for these jobs because their tasks are so different. Um, I had come to the conclusion that was also true in the intelligence area. That is to say, the kind of skills that were needed for counterintelligence, counterterrorism, and intelligence were a lot different than classic law enforcement. I can explain that, but it, takes, it would take too long, to, perhaps in the questioning. So therefore, my first concern was changing the Bureau. And God knows there was enormous resistance to that. Now, Bob Mueller's theme after 9-11 was all FBI agents would be both law enforcement and counterintelligence and counterterrorism. I thought that was a fundamental mistake because they were different kind of skills. Uh, so that was my first concern. And it went back many years to my time as Deputy Attorney General. A corollary of that was a new division within the Justice Department that was partly to support the new operation within the FBI, but also partly for other reasons. I got the impression that OLC was under too much operational pressure to deal with questions that came out of the intelligence community, that OLC should only be used for major constitutional questions, and there should be a division within the Justice Department that acts as counsel or as the, the lawyer and also the litigator for the intelligence uh, operations in the United States. Now, I knew that many years ago there had been a division which had a very unlovely genesis as the, I forget what its name was, but it came, grew out of the McCarthy era and then was eliminated back in the uh, late 60s, or, or no, in the 70s, in the Nixon administration. I was hoping everybody would forget about that. <laughs> Uh, and the key, 
to getting the acceptance on the commission was convincing Judge Wald that that was a good idea. Uh, that, number one, we would have a separate bureau operation that would be focused, as I told you, and then a separate counterpart division within the Justice Department, which would meld together the lawyers who had dealt with FISA court, some of the criminal lawyers that had done intelligence, and also other lawyers who would be operating as counsel for the intelligence community. There was enormous resistance in the Justice Department to both ideas. Uh, Bob Mueller told me at a luncheon when I first uh, expressed the idea, he said, you'll never be able to get it through. The ACLU will be on my side and will stop you. My secret was Pat Wald. That blunted the ACLU. Uh, so is, is okay. it fair to say, I, I mean, I'm, I'm inferring this from what you said, but is it fair to say that the idea that, that of this reorganization was driven by you? Yes, because I had, uh, been Deputy Attorney General and had thought about that problem. Uh, I have to say, Mike Leiter helped enormously. I had recruited Mike as one of my uh, associate general counsels and deputy general counsels, and he agreed entirely with me. And he, now, now Chuck Robb, of course, agreed, but it wasn't an area which he had, was that familiar with. Uh, and, and Mike helped me. I, I said I had enormous resistance from the Attorney General Gonzalez from Bob Mueller, uh, from uh, the former head of the criminal division, Mike Chertoff, who lobbied incessantly against it, from Alice Fisher. Uh, and then I, the, it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and Fran Townsend was put in charge of implementing our commission report. And she called me and said, what do we do about it? I said, well, you're going to, one of the problems with the intelligence community is the president hasn't been seen to make decisions. Uh, I know he quietly goes along with certain things, but not enough where he actually makes decisions. And uh, so the president told Attorney General Gonzalez he had to meet with Chuck, Rob, and me. And so he hired uh, Pat Philbin, who was an ex-law clerk of mine, to act as the, his help in resisting me. I, we had this meeting, and I told uh, Albert Gonzalez that I had made a terrible mistake that I hadn't been tough enough. Uh, and he, he gave up. Uh, and, the pre and eventually the president publicly directed him to establish the new division, and Congress went along with it in the new uh, assistant attorney generalship. Mueller resisted uh, doing what I thought was necessary in the FBI, but it took, so it took longer than, uh, than I hoped to accomplish that organizational change. So you had this other intervening prior experience that you know, people in this room are very familiar with, which is as a member of the FISA Court of Review in the initial uh, hearings on the uh, case on the wall. And you know, I look at this, and uh, we were talking about this a little bit before we came in, and I, and I, lo I look at this as, a, as a, a story of sort of philosophical continuity on your part, that you know, in, the, in the Wall case, you look at this bureaucratic organization of, of, of the Justice Department and the FBI, and you say, I don't know where the idea that this is legally required comes from, and you kind of knock it down as a judicial matter. And then when you come in to, to, to run this commission, you look at that same set of structures or a related set of structures from an administrative matter and say, a, a, an administrative organization point of view and say, this makes no sense as an organizational matter and you kind of drive the train to change it. And so my question is, what's, you've talked about the relationship between the creation of the, depart, uh, of the division and your service as attorney, as deputy attorney general. But what is the relationship between the the experience of sitting on that case um, and and the subsequent bureaucratic development? I understand why you asked the question, but I don't think there's really a connection, because when I was focusing on the case, I was thinking strictly as a judge, uh, and it was only a legal question as to whether the wall was constitutionally required or not. 
Um, I don't think I ever thought about that when I was co-chairman. I wasn't the boss. I was co-chairman of the Intelligence Commission. I was thinking only as drawing upon my prior experience in several departments as a manager, not as a judge. I, I sort of assiduously avoided thinking as a lawyer when I took that year and a half off as a uh, co-chairman of the commission. And so when you raised it earlier, just before we got on, I was sort of surprised because it never even remotely occurred to me that there was any connection. Because when I worked on that famous case, which I discussed with you at the time I did it, because it was ex party, uh, and I was only thinking of the legal requirements. Uh, and I thought, as you point out, the wall had been created because of a Fourth Circuit opinion that really wasn't relevant or wasn't commanding. Um, but so I'm, I don't think there's a necessary connection. All right. So I'm interested. You're looking out over an audience in major part composed of people who work for the, depart the division that you kind of imagined um, and pushed for and against a, a pretty solid wall of opposition made happen. And I'm, you know, I'm interested to what extent you've had occasion to think about the institutional performance of the structure you advocated over time, both in the Bureau and in the Justice Department, as you think about sort of 10 years of, of this vision of yours coming to fruition, what, what, what are you in a position to say about how it's worked? To what extent there are problems that have arisen that you didn't anticipate? To what extent uh, you look back and say, ha ha, I told you so? Uh, My uh, friend and counterpart, uh, Richard Posner, thought I was too timid with respect to the Bureau. He thought the counterintelligence, intelligence, counterterrorism should be pulled out entirely as a separate department, uh, coinciding with MI5 in Britain. Uh, the pro I kept telling him the problem with that is where were you going to put that department? And he sort of gulped and said, um, homeland. Uh, and then he thought about it and said, well, that's not a very good idea either, is it? Uh, and I said, no, it's not. But there, I would have, if I, in hindsight, I would have created a separate deputy, or had it created, of the FBI in charge of that. One of the things that sort of shocked me when I had lunch that not day with Bob Mueller, he was so proud of the fact that so many of the new bureau agents were older, close to 30, mature men and women. And what bothered me is I had learned that the CIA, some of their most important new recruits were 21. And brilliant young men and women who were technologically superior and could then be taught also the intelligence business. Uh, and one of the recruiters at the CIA said, if we waited for people who were 30, we wouldn't get the ones we're trying to get because they would have already made $70 million uh, developing a new technology. We need imaginative young people. So I wonder whether the Bureau has moved as much as I would like to see in that direction uh, because counterintelligence requires a different, entirely different skill than law enforcement. What about the Justice Department? I mean, when I, all I hear is good things, but that means everybody who I know who went there as either an assistant attorney general or a senior person has said that, it, that it's wonderful. So uh, I'm not in a position to make any judgment. Uh, so OK, if I, were, if, I, if I were the president and I appointed you the head of Rob Silverman II, the job of which was to go back over the look. recommendations and sort of figure out where, where we've made progress and where we haven't. What, what, are the, what are the issues that you would be looking for in a sort of 10-year assessment of this question? How, how should we think about assessing whether, whether 
the institutional structure that was created was in fact responsive adequately to the problems that you identified. Are you speaking of the Bureau or the uh, litigating division? Which a little, a little bit of both. Well, on the Bureau, I would be most, the Bureau has been successful, uh, thank God. Uh, but I would be very concerned about the line of progression. In other words, are you hiring men and women who uh, have this capability to deal with uh, counterintelligence and intelligence and counterterrorism? And what is their line of progression? Can they get up to the top of the bureau without uh, chasing bank robbers? Uh, because they're a different, uh, as I say, different task. Uh, that would something that would concern me. And indeed, I recommended Martin Feldstein to be on the Bureau's advisory board, and he, fo the great economist at Harvard, and I suggested to him, and he did focus on those, the training and the line of progression, and he said it got better and better. But I don't really know because I haven't had an opportunity to look. On the division in the Justice Department, I would ask, number one, what is the relationship between the division and its client, the intelligence? How much tension arises when there are problems of legality? How, because you are both a lawyer for a client and sometimes, if necessary, prosecutors. How does that work? And I've always realized that was a potential dilemma. How does the division work with the criminal division? How does it work with the rest of the department? I don't know. Those are the questions I would ask. One more question, and, and then I think our time is up. Um, when you look back on the recommendations that you made and the, and the success in, in implementing this one, um, but you don't have, you know, but you haven't gone through that exercise of, of, of doing the rigorous examination of it. How do you reflect on the creation of NSD? What's, you know, is, is that a, you know, I, I did my part and this is out of my hands now? Or is there, you know, do you reflect on it with, with satisfaction? What's, what, what's, what's your, uh, among the, the long, long list of things you've done in, uh, in, in your career, where does this stack up on, on, on that list? Well, number one, it was the most interesting and exciting thing I ever did in government. I really think back of it. I think of it that way. Uh, it was such a challenge to uh, build up this staff. And when you build up a staff to do this kind of examination, you necessarily draw from the intelligence communities themselves. And the question was how to get people to work effectively analyzing and examining their own home intelligence groups. That was not easy. Turns out if we had 100 people on the staff, say hypothetically, 20 did most of the work. Uh, and we did have a problem with people leaking back. I actually fired one woman from the FBI who leaked back to the FBI and insisted that she be fired from the FBI too. Uh, but looking back on everything, I, one of the things I have to say, first of all, being co-chairman with Chuck Robb was a wonderful experience. He is a hell of a man. He's got wonderful judgment. We sort of divided up. I, try, I had to do the inside work of managing, and he did our outside work and was brilliant. But I consulted him on everything. Uh, a more decent, you know, I've wa watched politicians over the years, and Chuck Robb is one of those who's wiser and smarter than he is articulate, which is the exact opposite of most politicians. Uh, so he was a, a joy to be with, and we are still dear friends. The other thing I have to say is the president spent a lot of time with us. We spent a lot of time with the president. I, I was blunt uh, and sometimes brutally frank with the president, particularly with respect to this Division, I said, you're going to have to order Gonzalez to do this, otherwise it's not going to get done, and you're going to have to order Mueller to do it, because there's such bureaucratic resistance. And he did. Well, he, and Fran Townsend, who he put in charge of the implementation, 
did a wonderful job too in helping. But if they ever had a 